it's good to just think about these things. I was just thinking about the, the whole nativity story, the whole Christmas story, and realizing all the different people that he used, all the different um, backgrounds they were from, and uh, thankfully this morning we have great encouragement, because it doesn't matter what age you are, doesn't matter what gender you are, doesn't matter what nationality you are, doesn't matter what background you have, God is in the business of picking people up and using them for his purposes and his plans. And he's got a great plan for us. And you, we may say even today, well, I'm old. And we'll look at some old people in a minute. You, we're, some of us are quite young. Some of us are very young. Some of us think we're young. Some of us are not so young. But you know what? God's got his hand upon us because Jesus didn't come just to give us Christmas or give us Easter. He came for that to impact on our lives personally. As we said before, historical accuracy and certainty into personal experience. That's what God wants. God with us, we sing, but God in us is amazing. And as I was just looking um, at all the figures and, and uh, different people in, in uh, the nativity and the Christmas story, I was just staggered. Uh, two things that cropped up in my mind, that God is what we call sovereign. So when we call God sovereign, we mean he's in control. He, he, whatever he, he does, he's, he's in control of it all. Now, we, we get a bit perplexed. How can we have free will, yet God still works out his purposes and plans? Well, I can't answer that because I'm not God. And uh, that's one of those questions that beyond my thinking. But you know what? We see it in history. We see history working its way out in God over the great kings of the earth. And we'll see that in a moment. And I also came at uh, God is gracious. That God is willing to use people we would think are unusable. Isn't it amazing? Uh, think uh, especially uh, culturally, as we'll see in a moment. But if we look back right, we looked just two weeks ago at the genealogy of Jesus, and we looked at the probability of how that it could happen, the way the Bible says it could happen, and we said it's impossible, probability-wise. It has to be a miracle. But interestingly, Matthew, uh, uh, Matthew is, is written primarily to Jews, and um, he, he's looking at the genealogy of Jesus, and he, he interestingly, puts a number of ladies' names in there. Now, in that culture, they would just put, if you look at Luke, son of, son of, son of. Uh, they just put the father, and, um, but not Matthew. <clears throat> and interestingly, Matthew didn't even put the most important women's names down, like um, Sarah, Rachel, those, those names that we know uh, that we would say, you're not too warm at the back here. Not too warm. No, you're right. If you fall asleep, I know you are. But you know what? He puts four women's names in there. Four women that are not Jews. Very interesting. Now remember, Matthew is writing to Jews. So he's making a point here. Four women that are not Jews. And three women with, uh, we would say, a little bit of a reputation. Not a great reputation. One was Tamar. Tamar was uh, Judah's daughter-in-law. Um, and Judah, he, he, she'd married the son, and the son had died. And then um, the other son had died. And uh, the, the, then he, she said, well, he's not giving me another son. And she was left a widow. So she played a trick on him, on Judah. And uh, she became pregnant by her father-in-law. You say, Is the Bible? Yeah, but I tell you what, the Bible's full of some... You know, really, he doesn't cover over some of the seedy stuff. So Tamar was not a Jew, and her reputation, well, you know, she was a bit... And then we come to a, another woman called Rahab. Now, we know her reputation, we know her, because sometimes the Bible calls her an innkeeper, but really, she was not an innkeeper per se. She was um, a woman of the night. She kept an inn, but not for innkeeping. Um, but you know what? God used her in the genealogy of Jesus. You say, Dave, you know what? God can take hold of someone who puts their life... You know what she did? She, she knew. She knew there was the God of Israel, and she put her life in their hands. She said, I'm in your hands. I, I'll, I'll protect you. You protect me, and I'll follow the God of Israel. 
And you know what? When we do that, God takes hold of our lives. And then we have another woman. Uh, of course, we have uh, Ruth, great woman Ruth. But again, not a Jew. Um, and then we have Bathsheba. Again, um, she'd married a non-Jew. But then, of course, David, we know the story. David um, uh, slept with her, had a baby. Uh, that baby was taken away, but then Solomon came along. So straight away we see in the genealogy, we, we see God's handiwork showing us that God will use anybody who puts their life in his hands. It's good news, that, isn't it? Background, if we give it to him, looks right over it and deals with it, deals with it. So God is sovereign. It, it is his story. I was just thinking, and I've said this before, um, Mary and Joseph are living in Nazareth. Nazareth is in the north of the country. Bethlehem is, is um, and Jerusalem is about 60, 70, well, 70, 80 miles south. Now you say, well, that's not far, Dave. Well, it, it, it is, isn't it? I mean, what's 70 miles from here? Um, Exeter? Maybe around that area, isn't it? Somewhere down there. Maybe not that far. Um, you know what? If you didn't have a car... In, in, in the old days, if, to go to Barry, wouldn't it? Or to go to Cardiff was a major day out. You know, where did they go on holidays years ago? Porth Gold. Oh, it's a bit, that's, that's far enough. And that's, not, that's nowhere near 70 miles. And that's with cars. And they, that's all they had was camels, horseback. So it was a long way. How was God going to get them from there down to Bethlehem to fulfill God's word? Remember, God had said the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. Remember we said, if God's word isn't true, if it doesn't come to pass, then we don't believe it. Because God's given us a mind to think and to ponder. So how is he going to get them all the way down there? Just in time for the baby to be born. Right place, right time. Interesting. You know what? God is sovereign. God is in control. The Bible says, in the days of Caesar Augustus, we just read, we read all this quickly, don't we? He, he, he said, I want a census to be, to be made. So the census meant you had to go back to your hometown and, and sign up. Caesar Augustus was one of the greatest Caesars ever. He was Julius Caesar's great nephew. And uh, he reigned for many, many years. Really clever guy, peace and stability. And of course, his name wasn't Augustus. He gave himself that name. Um, so he, 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 of course, these men were worshippers of many gods, but also aspired to be gods. Didn't they? they wanted to be worshipped, these Caesars. So his name was Octavian, but they gave him the name Augustus, which means esteemed one. Oh, enlightened one. He was aspiring to worship, and really, I, it was a kind of a monarchy, but he was in real good control. He was a, he was a really clever guy, depending on how you, you read history, of course, it's depending on what you think of him. But you know what? The greatest ruler of the greatest empire that the world's ever seen had to move at the will of God. Because God needed those, those, that couple to be in Bethlehem at the right time to give birth. How was God going to do it? He said, right, let's have a census. How do I get a census? I'll make sure that Caesar Augustus listens to me. The Bible says Solomon, one of the greatest kings, said the king's heart is like a water course. That God moves in any way he wants. Now again, we say, oh, Dave, oh, 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 he's God, yet we are free will. You know, God is awesome. God is mighty. So he gets hold of the greatest ruler, the greatest empire, and says, right, I want this to be done. And God gets it done. God gets it done for, to fulfill his word. Thankfully, we see all these different people involved. Zach, Zach, Zechariah and Elizabeth are the first people we come across, and they're old. For you old people this morning, use an encouraging word. They're old, and they are they're faithful, good guy, good people, righteous, upright, doing the work of the Lord. Yet they, are, they have been unfruitful. They have been barren. She's not had a baby. She's getting on in time. And, and of course, in the eyes of the society, she would have been looked down on. Because obviously, to have children in those days to, was to be blessed, was to be fruitful. Uh, uh, but in the eyes of the people around, even in the eyes of the church or the synagogue, they thought, no, oh, there's something going on there. There's some, uh, God is, 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 is having a go at them, or there's sin involved in their lives. And that's what we sometimes think. Be very careful. 
be very careful how we look at people, how we judge people, because so often we judge by, what would we say, don't judge a book by its cover, don't we? we we're quick to judge some of us. Um, and uh, especially, I grew up in a, a house full of boys. We we're really pretty good at that. Um, but that's what happened. But they were even forlorn because the Bible said they were praying for a child. They really were, really praying for a child. And God comes along and uh, he's going into the temple to offer incense. Remember we said before, again, think of the absolute perfect timing of God. Now, this, he probably would have only done this once in his lifetime, twice at the most. Um, and at that moment, God says, right, I'm going to go and speak to him now. And he was frightened. And, uh, but you know what God said to him? I have heard your prayer. I've heard your prayer. And although you've been uh, unfruitful and barren all these years, you are going to have a son. Not an ordinary son, a real one, one of those sons that he, he's just f- full of fire. <laughs> and uh, um, he didn't want to get the wrong side of John, John the Baptist. Um, but God had heard Old, old people thought it was too late, thought it was the end, thought it was too late. The first thing he, th- he said, my wife's passed it, he said. She wasn't there at the time because he wouldn't have said that in front of her, of course. Um, but my wife's passed it. God said, I've heard your prayers. It's never too late. How about young people? Mary and Joseph. I'm not really sure old Joseph's probably a bit older, but Mary was a teenage girl. Because once they get to 13 in that society, you were adults. There was no such thing as teenagers then. Like in, in, in the days gone by, I would, uh, our dad was working 15, um, and Eileen, 14, they were working then. Gee, I mean, look at look here. Some of these, yeah, 15, no. Well, you'd be out working by now. Get in there, down the pit. But that's what it was. No such thing. A teenager is a made-up thing, isn't it? But uh, they, were, they were adults by the time they were teenagers. So she was a young girl. Yet God takes hold of her life, sees something in her that he can use. And we looked at Mary uh, Christmas morning, how God just dropped into her heart, how God is gracious, God is generous, God is great. And uh, she just said, look, here I am, Lord. I am the Lord's servant. See, that's really the summation of what we are as disciples of God. I am your, I am your servant. Let your word be fulfilled in my life, whatever it costs. Now, again, looking from you, we read the story. We don't understand it too much. But the, it would have cost her a lot. Reputation, even at the extreme, her life. Because she was a, there she was. She was pregnant, um, which meant she had, she had committed adultery against her husband. She was betrothed to him. She, hadn't been, she, she was betrothed to him, but they hadn't consummated the marriage. So here, here she is, um, pregnant, and that was a capital offense in those days. But certainly, if not a capital offense, some, something she'd have to run away from. But she said, Lord, whatever you want to do for me, even if it's going to cost me a reputation, I'll do for you. That's a great, lovely spirit. That's why God used Mary. He saw something in her. And we, we forget Joseph sometimes, don't we? Because Joseph, the first thought he had was oh, total disappointment. He was, he was in love with this girl, and she'd betrayed him. Broken hearted he was. And, uh, but you know what? He wasn't like me and you, because uh, he, he wasn't reactive, didn't we? The first thing I would have said, you snake, get out. But the Bible says he was quite reflective. He thought, what am I going to do here now? And the Bible says, he said, I'll do this quietly. That's a good heart, isn't it? I'll do this quietly so it won't, it won't bring so much scandal to her. And as he was thinking, he was reflective. He was a good guy, a righteous guy. The Bible says he heard God's word as he pondered. And God said to him, okay, Joseph, I see, I see, I know what's happening. It's not anyone else. It's my doing. It's my work. It's okay. And he received God's word. And because of Joseph, everything worked out well. See, we don't forget Joseph. So often we elevate Mary and, of course, a great, lovely Beautiful spirit, but without Joseph, there would not have been a nativity. He could have really scuppered things and really put a kibosh on it all. But Joseph, again, a young man, ordinary man. Thankfully, God uses just ordinary folk. Mary and Joseph from Nazareth, as we said, nothing good from Nazareth. Just a little pokey little town. Poor people, 
We can see why they pour in a minute. Um, he was just an ordinary laborer. He was a carpenter. Um, just ordinary folk. But God used because they received the word of the Lord and they obeyed God's word. They just loved doing what God said. All these different people. Young people. Old people. Irrespective of background. Irrespective of shepherds we looked at the other day. Ordinary folk. No great claim in life just looking after sheep although it's very interesting i didn't mention the other other day they were watchers of watching sheep that's what the word says watching watching it is is more than possible it's probable that those particular sheep they were looking after would have supplied the temple sacrifices in those days um they would uh, if they sinned they would bring a sacrifice to the temple confess their sin and offer a sacrifice that's what they did that's how they worked out their their sin and of course, lambs especially were offered one in the morning, one in the night, and, and especially on Passover, the lamb, they would get hold of a lamb and offer that lamb, roast it, and, and we know all the uh, ins and outs of that. But they were men that would be supplying this, the Passover lamb. It's no coincidence God used those men who were watching those lambs, watching for the Passover lamb to actually go and meet the real Passover lamb. The Bible calls Jesus the Passover lamb. That, mo- that day. So Jesus used shepherds. Then, thankfully, for some of us, he didn't leave the intelligent people out. <laughs> or the nobility out. See, God uses those in high authority as well. So we have the wise men. The magi. Who were from a, a science background. They were from a high caste um, class of people. Uh, really, if you go back in time, if you think of, remember the story of Daniel. Daniel was uh, not an ordinary person. He was, he was from, the, from the royalties, uh, Daniel. He was from nobility. And the Bible says they took them from there and put him into Babylon, and they got all the best boys and of nobility without any fault, physical fault, and really clever guys, and they, they trained them up to be these people who would would be counselors, would, would bring wisdom. So that was the kind of class, that was probably the caste that they were from. And God used those people to come. And again, to witness and to testify. As we said, isn't it amazing how they came all those hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of miles, not quite a thousand, but hundreds of miles, on the back of God's word and someone's testimony. I wonder what we sometimes, some of us need to really believe God's word or to obey God's word. See, they, they, they had taken God's word and they said, well, this is what God's word says. Back in Numbers 24, a man called Balaam, who was actually um, trying to uh, prophesy or speak for God for profit, it, God can use anybody in anything. And God uses Balaam... Um, who's in the wrong place, with the wrong people, with the wrong motive, to still speak God's word. Why? Because God's sovereign. And in his fourth pro- prophetic word, he says, a star will rise. He says, I can see it. someone's going to be born, but not yet. And a star will come up from Jacob, and he will have a sept, and he will rule. And you see, they took hold of that word. They, they knew a Messiah was coming. Why did they know that? Again, they weren't Jews. They were foreigners. Because of the influence of Daniel and his three men. It's amazing the power of influence and the power of testimony we have. People are looking and watching and seeing who we are for him. And who who we're living for him. And are we showing him this morning? And Daniel, and they took all of Daniel's testimony. And believed God's word. And traveled all those miles. And what did they do? They came and they bowed and they worshipped. First of all, they went, of course, to the palace. Um, and as I said before, and I, of course I was, I was mistaken, I was wrong. Don't tell Jackie I said that. We, we talked about the religious people, didn't we? About their reactions. Um, that they were really complacent. Totally uh, didn't bother them. That why? Because they were comfortable in their lives. They were comfortable in their position. So they didn't really care if a Messiah was coming because they had a great position. They were wealthy. They had a bit of power. They run the show under the Romans, but really they had a little bit of carte blanche there. And they didn't want to be challenged 
in their lifestyle. We know well when you come to Jesus, there's a challenge. There's going to be a change. Of course there is. Now I'm under his authority. Now I'm going to follow him. He knows best, so I don't understand why we don't do it. But there's going to be a change. And uh, they come and they, for the, I would say probably this is the third time they came. Or the, or the, the Pharisees, the, the religious people. For the third time they heard this story about the Messiah. First with the shepherds, remember the shepherds? And of course they would have thought, well, they're just lowly shepherds, you don't listen to them. But they were spreading the news. And uh, we'll see in a moment the second time. But this is the third time because this was months after Jesus was born. And they came and, um, of course, they go to Herod. And uh, Herod is one of those leaders who was absolutely Jesus. He was a real psychopath. Um, he killed... Um, I'm going to say he killed his mother-in-law, but we'll give him that. No, careful now, no, no. Um, he killed um, his, his, his wife. He killed his few of his sons. The, 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 the statement of that time was the only safe person in, in the court was his dog. I think on his deathbed, he killed one of his sons or had one of his sons killed. So this guy, we can see his thinking. He's a nutter. Um, and, of course, he's, he's called himself again. He's called himself king of the Jews. And so the wise men turn up and say... Where is this Messiah, the King of the Jews? And first thing Herod is, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. There's only one of those. But you know what? He's a sneaky one, isn't he? He said, oh, he said, well, go and find him. Come back and tell me because I want to worship him as well. You know what? Sometimes when we read God's word, we, we don't understand. and we, we, we ret- The Bible says in Jeremiah that at that time... Uh, Rachel will be mourning in Ramah because of, of the children that would be slaughtered. And that's a projection, a prophecy that at that time something major would happen, something terrible would happen. Um, and you know what? God saw it. God saw it. He said, why did he, didn't he stop it? Well, that's God's prerogative. I'm not sure there. But God saw down through history that this Herod would fulfill the prophecy. Why? Because God doesn't look at time like us. He's looking from above, isn't he? And Herod, when he knew he'd been duped, the Bible says that the, the, the wise men came and give him not just anything, but they give him their heart, their treasures. And then, interest, listen to what it says, they go back a different way. They are changed. They go back a different way. They changed. Their lives are changed. But once Herod found out he'd been duped, what did he say? Every boy, two years and under, around the Bethlehem area, kill him kill him. God saw that many years before and said there'll be mourning and you won't, you won't comfort the mothers because they know the children have been murdered. Sometimes we, we again, we, we think that's awful, but don't we say so often, 10 million babies have been killed in the womb since 1967. 10 million nearly. Um, and we'd say, what about, about 99% have been uh, on, on the altar of convenience, haven't they? For nothing else but convenience. And uh, so we're, we're, nothing's changed, but you see, God sees and uses. And then he comes maybe to the last people we look at. Old people again, Simeon and Anna. Ah, they, again, they, that was the, the Bible says Anna was 84. That's old, isn't it? Oh. 85. Uh, uh, old. But God still got things for us to do. You see, this would be the second time the Pharisees and the religious people heard about Jesus. And these weren't shepherds. Now these were older folk in those days. They, they elevated older folk. These days we don't think much of them, do we? Not a lot of respect, really. But in, in that culture, old meant wise and respect. You stood up for your elders, didn't you? Remember, we used to in school. We used to, when a teacher came in, we used to stand up. Don't they? Probably don't do that. Do they do that now? No. Teacher comes in, you stand up. Oh, well done. Oh, that's good. We used to stand up for him. Don't know why, but then. Um, but in those days, respect. And Simeon is there, and the Bible talks of Simeon again, righteous, devout, careful. Um, looking for, the, for looking for the good of the nation, looking for God to come. Back to the, he sees the, the nation gone so far from God. Simeon is praying and looking for God to do a work in the nation. 
The Bible says the Holy Spirit is upon him, but he's, he's had a revelation. He says, you will not depart. You will not die until you see the Messiah. And he's thinking to himself, uh, did I really hear right? Did, did this really, did, did I actually hear what God said? Because sometimes we doubt that. The devil loves us to doubt. And did, did God say, did he do this? Did he do that? But you know what? One day he just felt an impression by the Holy Spirit to walk into the temple. And that particular day, again, right time, right place, Mary and Joseph were coming in just to do the, the ordinary thing of the time, which was to, to uh, offer a sacrifice for a purification and for the firstborn son. We know they were, they, we know they were poor. Uh, and this, that's why it predates the, the wise men, because they bought two turtle doves. If they were, if they were wealthy, they, they would have bought a lamb and a dove. But if you couldn't afford it, you bought two doves. So they were poor people, ordinary folk. And they came in. And, and you know, you've got a temple there, and it's full. People everywhere uh, doing their business. You know, and of course, we know it wasn't proper business somewhere. There was a bit of a few snakes going on there. But um, he comes in, and he sees this couple. How did he know that this particular couple and this baby would be the Messiah? You know, when you pick up a baby, you haven't got a clue what it's going to be, have you? You don't know what that baby and how much, uh, how much it's going to cost you, how much heartache it's going to cause you, or how much joy it's going to cause you. You don't know what the baby's going to be, but he saw by faith. He saw past the natural. Faith is seeing past what we can see with our natural eyes, you see. Is, is actually seeing what God says. And he takes hold of that baby and he begins to thank God, praise God, then he, and praise. And, and then he begins to speak the word of God, prophesy. Very important. Praise and prophesy. That's why you say, I want something from God. I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to prophesy. You begin to learn to praise. Begin to learn to praise. That's what you need to do. And he's beginning to praise God. Thank you, Father. You fulfilled your word. Now I can go home. Now I, you can take me. Because I've seen the salvation of God. And he begins to speak of, of Jesus and what he's going to do. Then he speaks to the, the, the mother. Said, this is good. He's going to cause you some pain. Um, and of course, we, we, when you see she's at the, at the cross and she, and she sees him die in there. And other times that uh, he speaks. Uh, cause her some real pain. And uh, then at the same time, there was an older woman, again, um, a prophetess, comes, 84 years of age, and, and her life was just caught up with prayer and just spending time with God. I tell you what, we need those widows. I remember um, uh, Paul Mercy saying about in those days, in many years gone by, the, the old widows, of course, there was nothing to take up their time then, were there? No TV, no distractions, and they would spend day and hours and hours just praying. Praying. And one of them called him up once and said, uh, you, need, you need to have a look at your car. There's something wrong with your car. And he thought, what are you talking about? Something wrong with your car. And he, he knew that she knew nothing about cars. And uh, so he, 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 he listened to her and he found, uh, I'm not sure what it was, but it was uh, something with a suspension, which could have been quite dangerous. Uh, but these women were women of prayer, and that's why the church is flourished. I remember talking to Mike when he went to Guildford, um, Port, where it was, used to be Dave Porson's church, and there were about 500 there then. Um, and I said, you know, what's it? he said, well, there are a few ladies that gather every morning to pray. Five in the morning to pray. See, pray, pray. We need, we need these people. And Anna, well, that was her life caught up. And as she came in, she gave thanks. She saw the baby, and she began to speak. This is the redemption of Israel. Were you looking for the redemption? This is the one. This is the one. And uh, so we see old and young, background of no importance, but people who hear God's word, love God's word, and will do God's word. Thankfully, God is still looking to come into any man, woman's life. The power of insignificance. Isn't it amazing how, who God will use if they will put their lives in his hands? Jesus was there and he had 5,000 men and, and maybe a few more than that were women and children. And he said, they have been your days. Let's, he said to the disciples, let's feed them. And the disciples said, you, what are you doing? We can't, gonna, we can't feed them. And Jesus said, will you feed them? And uh, I think it was Philip said, look, you need eight months wages to feed these lot. And then Andrew, I don't know what he was thinking. He said, oh, you're a, a young lad, you know, we've got five loaves and two fish. 
And then he adds it. He puts something in the end. But what can that feed? And the Bible says, Jesus said, give it to me. Give it to me. And Jesus takes it, blesses it, breaks it, gives it, and it becomes a blessing. See, the insignificance of our lives. I am nobody. I'm nothing. I'm too young. I'm too old. The worst thing is if we think we're something, then we're in trouble. But if we are insignificant, in the hands of the living God can be used mightily. I love the story of the little girl. She's taken captive um, by Naaman, the great general, Syrian general. And uh, uh, the Bible says that he becomes um, leprous. So all, all, the, all, his, all that he had meant nothing. He was rich. He was powerful. He had all the things that meant nothing now. There was a young girl that he'd taken captive, a slave girl. And uh, in her heart, I wonder what she thought. Well, I'm young. I'm a slave. I'm a woman, a girl. Um, They're not going to listen to me. She could have thought, how dare, I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad he's got leprosy, the way he's treated me. I'm a slave. And, and she could have become all bitter and all twisted and allowed her circumstances and allowed her background and allowed all the things that have been done to her to affect her witness. And sometimes we do that, don't we? Oh, have mercy on us. But you know what she said? She had enough boldness. She, again, you, you didn't speak till you were spoken to. She said, can I say something? There is someone in Israel, a prophet. If my master goes and sees him, she, he will be made well. See, insignificant little girl has a significant power and influence on a general. She didn't allow her circumstances, her background, her whatever you can think of to stop her being used by God. Amen. This morning, when we look at the nativity, we see all different backgrounds, shapes, sizes. This morning, we look around at each other, all different shapes, sizes, backgrounds, you know, in the hands of God, we can be used. God wants to use us. Let's just pray. And uh, I think we will sing. Um, why do we? I'm going to sing another carol. I think we're going to sing our Let's pray. Thank you, Father. When we look at the nativity, we, we see all the different people going on. We see you are sovereign. You can use anybody, anything. It is your story. But you're so gracious. that You take people from... Uh, lowly positions and can use them. You take people from high positions, Lord, and you can use them. Lord, you would say to us this morning, I want to use you. I want to come into your life. Maybe for the first time, Lord, we just have to invite you in. I must come to your house today. Come into this house of mine, my life. Lord, forgive me if I've kept you up for such a long time. Forgive my sin. Have mercy on me. Come in. And, Lord, we will be used this year. They come to the end of this year, the beginning of a new year. Lord, we will be used of you. Insignificant, but in your hands. Supernatural significance. Help us, we pray. Amen. Don't forget, next week is the first.